Hello my friends, I hope you're doing well and I'm excited because today we're talking about mistakes that you're probably making. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but these are mistakes that I've made. And I'm pretty sure you're making at least one of these. And I'm excited because not only are we gonna talk about the mistakes, but I'm gonna give you some tips along the way for how to not make those mistakes because I wanna help you become a better screenwriter. So here we go, mistake number one, overriding the bane of every screenwriter. I mean, we're writers, right? So we should write and we do. And we keep going and going and going and going until we're basically writing a novel instead of a screenplay. So let me give you a quick example of what I mean. The suburban neighborhood was built using the same blueprint for every single house on the block. Two-story Tudors with high windows and large double doors. At least one minivan parked in front of each house. Mature oaks line the street and their roots make the sidewalks bump and churn sporadically. Or, oak trees line the suburban street with cookie-cutter beige homes. Minivans seem to be a prerequisite for every homeowner. These are essentially the same thing, but the first is vastly overwritten. And if you take into account the slug line, the second one could be even shorter. Exterior, suburban street, day. Cookie cutter beige homes surrounded by oak trees and minivans. A paradise for soccer moms everywhere. And overriding happens all the time. The reason for it is we see all of the stuff in our heads. I mean, when we imagine the scene, we see all of the two-story Tudor homes, the large double doors, the sidewalks that are being moved by the tree roots that have happened slowly over time. The thing is, None of that stuff matters for the story. It might be nice window dressing, but rarely do you need to mention the color of the curtains or even that there are curtains, unless someone is hiding in them or they're being used by a character for something. So here's a good rule of thumb for descriptions. If your character is going to interact with the thing in some way, tie the curtains together to create a rope to escape from the second story window, for example, then you only need to spend time on those elements. You only have to mention those things. Everything else, you don't worry about it. If it's story critical, note it. Otherwise, skip it. And what you have to do as a screenwriter is learn to focus on what's important. In other words, if it was being shot, what would be in focus? I mean, you've watched enough film and TV to know that only things that matter are in focus. But as screenwriters, we want to include and describe everything because we see everything. But the thing is, it's not in focus. It's not going to be in focus. So it doesn't matter what the neon signs say that are hung in the bar. Just the fact that the place is lit by neon lights. Ultimately, here's what we writers tend to think. You know, I'm, I'm just not very confident as a screenwriter. We're thinking that. So I'm going to put everything in to make sure that you, dear reader, know that I know what I'm doing. The problem is by overwriting, the reader is actually hearing this writer isn't very confident. So I'm going to bail on the story. And we can all agree we don't want any reader bailing on our story. Typically, overwriting happens in description. So here's a practice exercise that you can do that will help you out if you are uh, succumbing to this mistake. First, watch something that you've never seen before. It doesn't matter what it is. You're not watching for the story, it doesn't matter. You're watching to practice. You're going to choose one scene in one location. So watch a scene that happens in one location and watch it only one time, then, Pause the movie and try to write a scene description for that location in 20 words or less. The above examples, just for reference, the above examples I gave that were better were 20 words and 16 words respectively. So you can totally do this in 20 words or less. And you're gonna quickly learn what you need and what you don't need to communicate about the setting or location for any scene and do it without overwriting, especially if you can stick to that 20 word limit. Mistake number two, writing stuff that can't be shot, also known as unfilmables. So some clarification. Now, not all unfilmables are bad. Every writer uses them, but they're used judiciously and with caution. So here are two places that you can use unfilmables. First, introducing your main character. Generally, you get a sentence or two to describe your main character. The description itself helps the reader know that this character is critically important to the story because the more time you spend describing a character usually equates to their importance in the story. So it's fine to do something like 
Parker, mid-30s, slick hair, leather jacket, would give any used car salesman a run for his money, strolls through the parking lot like he owns the place. He doesn't. He's a total poser. There are some unfilmables in that description, but these are okay in this circumstance because they're communicating how we're supposed to feel about Parker without telling us how to feel about Parker. The other acceptable place to use unfilmables is when describing settings. Usually a comment gets used to contrast or give emotional flavor to a setting. For example, this used to be a thriving metropolis where the rich frolicked and played and spent their fortunes. Now it's a weed infested dump, barely suitable for the refugees trying to carve out a home. Now, sure, a filmmaker might show the thriving metropolis and dissolve into present day overgrowth, but they don't need to. But it gives us as a reader a quick impression and feeling of what this place is like. And that's the thing with unfilmables. When you use them, you're using them to evoke emotion in the reader and only for that. Where they're bad and where they often get misused and get writers into trouble is in trying to communicate some bit of exposition. Skylar hated her sister Vera and couldn't stand being in the same room with her after Vera stole Skylar's boyfriend during her senior year. I mean, that is a train wreck of a description. So much to unpack, and it's really just about this. What would you see on screen? Literally what you're gonna see is Skylar glaring at Vera. I mean, that's what it should be written here. Skylar glares at Vera, who's oblivious to the look. And this is a common mistake in screenplays because we're supposed to be communicating things visually or in subtext or metaphor or using a host of other tools at our disposal. Because if it's information the audience who is watching the story needs to know, then they need some way to see it. And putting it in your script as an unfilmable description is a big no-no. We can't see that, we can't film it, but the audience needs to know it, but it's not working. So that's why it's bad. So if you're using an unfilmable for exposition or as something that is taking the place of something that you can show, okay, that's a recipe for disaster. So to fix it, just remove it. I mean, if it's important to the story, you'll find a way to get it back in the story somewhere where you're showing and not telling. And if you want to use unfilmables in a way that helps your story, you have to use them sparingly, you have to use them at your own risk, and you have to use them to evoke emotions in your audience. Mistake number three is writing blow by blow action. Now here's the trap. We imagine a story and we get so in tune with the characters and what they're doing and we begin to imagine everything. We see all the little details, all the little stuff, even to the point that we're imagining, okay, this character is right-handed and Sharon grips the knife in her right hand and spins away from Carl ducking under his roundhouse kick and slicing him across the face as he turns around. But Carl spins, sweeping Sharon's foot, knocking her off balance so she's falling back toward the glass table, her elbow hitting the table first, shattering it. But she manages to roll away and come up with a shard of glass in her left hand, and now she has two knives. If you can track with this, I seriously doubt you're seeing it as I'm seeing it in my head, even though it's kind of blow-by-blow -blow action. But what's more is if this continues any longer, this is boring to read with a capital B and a yawning. Okay, here's the same scene. Sharon's got a knife. Carl's got his karate skills. And all things considered, it's a toss up for who's going to win. Sharon slices Carl across the face, but Carl sends Sharon into the plate glass table. But now she picks up a glass shard and has two knives advantage Sharon. The difference here is the first one is just talking about the action. The second one is helping you understand how you should feel about the action. And this is the key with screenwriting. It's about the emotional experience of the viewer or the reader. So you want to make sure you are emphasizing those emotional elements. That's why overriding is bad. It's not about emotion. That's what makes unfilmables good or bad. They're good with emotion. They're bad without. And that's why blow by blow action is bad. There's no emotion. So you gotta focus on the emotion, focus on the results and get out. And let me spend a second here. It is not your job to figure out how Sharon cuts Carl on the face. Your job is to focus on the result. In other words, it's important for the story and the emotion of the scene that Sharon cuts Carl across the face. The how she does it isn't important. The result, the fact that she does it, that's what's important. And blow-by-blow blow action is focused on the how. The how is not your job. 
That's the job of the director, stunt coordinator, cinematographer, a few other people, including the actors and what they can or can't do. Your job is to emphasize how the audience is feeling throughout the action. Whether it's a fight, a car chase, an argument, a dance party, doesn't matter, and you mention the results. So focus on the results, focus on the emotion, and get out. Here's another example. The YouTube viewer nods in understanding. Things are making sense. The fog is lifting. And in a moment of clarity, the viewer hits the like button, maybe even decides to subscribe because of the value. Later, they'll even scan the description, clicking links they find interesting, or even visiting Patreon to further support Jake and his efforts to help screenwriters tell stories that matter. And when all is said and done, heavenly choirs sing, rainbows span the horizon, and the animals all sing like it's some Disney musical. And seriously, thank you for supporting me and this channel and comment below if you've made any of these errors with a simple, I've done that, I'll start, I've done that. Mistake number four, the dialogue errors of AI epic and of announcing. Now, we haven't talked about common mistakes that occur within dialogue, but these are two I see all the time and they are so common, I would figured I'd just kind of lump them together. So this is kind of a twofer. In fact, in my recent one scene challenge, I'll link that here, the scene I chose had these issues, but so did nearly every other submission. So I wasn't picking on one submission, okay? So this is a common mistake that gets made. First, let's deal with the iavic, okay? Or as you and I both know, this is when characters talk to each other, but the things they are saying are things both of them already clearly know, but it's information the screenwriter thinks the audience needs to know. So it's dialogue purely for the sake of the audience. So when characters say the name of each other too much, or when characters start any sentence with, remember when, or even worse, as you know, th those are all bad, or when characters vocalize their the nature of their relationship with one another. If you weren't my ex-girlfriend, I'd say yes. Okay, all these are bad, bad. There's just lazy writing. At worst, it takes the reader or viewer immediately out of the story because the dialogue feels fake and contrived so as to only communicate to the audience information the audience needs to know. But what's really going on here, what you're really doing, is you're actually insulting the audience. Come on. Where did you learn our language? I listened. Because they're sitting there thinking like, what, you didn't think that we could figure out that she was his ex-girlfriend? You calling me stupid? We'll need an example. The redhead? Mm -hmm. I'll do it. You shouldn't be involved. What should I do? Keep your teeth together and go back to work. And this is the reason these dialogue mistakes are bad. They make you come across as a lazy writer because you couldn't find a more clever way to communicate the information that you needed to communicate and you insult the intelligence of the audience at the same time. You dig like a dog. Did you call me a dog? I said you dig like one, flinging earth carelessly like an animal. So now I'm an animal. You're not listening. I'm deaf. And this holds true for the announcing mistake too. Announcing is when characters say either what they're doing or what we already see on the screen. Exterior, Central Park, day. A nice day in the park, people everywhere, even a hot dog vendor selling his wares. David, there's a hot dog vendor. Want one? Um, we see the vendor. You know, a character doesn't have to announce it. Again, it's insulting to the audience because you're basically saying, hey, for all of you idiots who didn't notice the hot dog vendor that I capitalized in the description and is the only person of the many that I singled out, let me make it clear about who we're talking about. Okay, that's just bad. So to fix it, you just get rid of it. I mean, literally remove all the announcing. Just delete, delete, delete. Exterior Central Park Day, a nice day in the park. People everywhere. Even a hot dog vendor selling his wares. David, want one? Charlotte, well, yeah. David, a dog. Fine. Okay, and just like this, removing the announcing and the, as you and I both know, gives you more opportunities for subtext, humor, misunderstandings, which are way more fun in a story. You, you could have killed him at will. Yes. Why the deception? Deception is the point. 
Any fool can calculate the string. That one has been doing it for the moment they saw us. Now he has to calculate what he can't see. For fear where he doesn't know. So to fix these dialogue mistakes, if you're making them, just simply remove them from your script. If it's information you feel is important, you gotta find a way to visually communicate that information. It'll make your story better, it's gonna insult your audience less, and all those are good things. These four mistakes that I've mentioned are some of the more common ones I see in my students and clients, but this is not an exhaustive list. And if you'd like my help with your screenplay, I do offer script consultation services. You submit your script, you choose a time from the available options for our conversation, I read your script and make notes on it and about it, what's working, what isn't, and we have an online conversation about it. I share with you my thoughts, you can ask questions, and we'll find solutions to help you move your script to the next level. And we even talk about some patterns that I'm seeing in your writing that you can address to help you become a better storyteller. So if you'd like my help with your feature script or your TV pilot, Click on the script consultation link below to learn more information. And if you're ready, book a consultation. Ultimately, I want to help you become a better writer and storyteller. And if you found any value and you haven't already, please be sure to like, subscribe, bell, all of that. I really do appreciate it. And when you go to tell a story, no matter how many mistakes you along the way, you're going to make some, but no matter how many mistakes you make along the way, be sure you tell a story that matters. See you later.